This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition, special live at the Broward County Youth Climate Summit, the third annual. So delighted to be a part of that. I've got with me my co-host, Chuck. Nice, Chuck. Hey, Neil. So obviously, while I know a little bit about climate, I don't know anything near who we've got here as guest. Yeah. Uh, a very important addition to this, because for Cosmic Queries, we want to make sure we have the right expertise at the right time at the right place which is now. I've got Gavin Schmidt. Gavin, welcome back to Star Talk. Hi, Neil. Chuck, nice to be back. Hey, Excellent. Gavin. And, and, and you recently became, seen, in addition to being director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is a, 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 a NASA satellite office in Manhattan. Many people don't know about that one. Um, they know about yeah. Kennedy Space Center and, you know, and, 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 and uh, in Houston. But uh, we've got a little pocket of NASA in New York City, and you're there as our neighbors. So good to know that. But you're also uh, uh, ele elevated or, or it's, it's, it's just a promotion, I guess, to senior advisor on climate to NASA. So it's wow. nice to know right. that such a position exists because uh, it's well, more well, than it just now. Yes, it does. It does now. <laughs> it's and brand it's, it's, new. Yes, it's it's not good enough just to research on climate. This stuff has to get communicated. Yes, and if you're an advisor to NASA, and NASA is a hugely public entity in our lives, not only domestically but in the world, um, you've got a really key place there. And uh, let me just lead off before we get to the questions that I know Chuck has collected, because that's the the the, the DNA of this format is questions from you, from from the public coming back to get answered uh, in our Star Talkian way. But let me just ask you, uh, Gavin, uh, sh should we not be surprised that this Youth Climate Summit is being organized in Florida uh, and not Colorado or one of the mountain states? <laughs> if you could tell us what, what special relationship well, Florida has with climate change. Well, you know, Florida is, is ground zero for uh, the impacts of uh, things like sea level rise, uh, coastal flooding, um, greater intensity of hurricanes, uh, and so you know we're seeing we're seeing changes in, in the in the temperature of the sea uh, around uh, Florida. We're seeing changes in the storm climate, um, and, and we're seeing sea level rise, and uh, and that puts Florida very much at the uh, a, a ground zero for. Uh, the really acute impacts of climate change that's happening now, uh, not least uh, the things that may be happening in the future. You know, I, I remember seeing, was it not last year, but perhaps the year before, uh, there was one, a satellite photo of hurricanes all lined up, ready to slam into Florida. It was like, okay, your turn. It was like they were lining up at the deli, right? And I, I just have no memory of seeing such, um, such persistence of assault yeah. on a coastline. Yeah, I mean, 20, 2020 was a very bad year for hurricanes. A very, very active uh, Atlantic season. Um, I think twenty fifteen was the was the previous one that was that was uh, no two thousand two thousand five was was uh, was a really big year too. Um, and uh, that's not what you expect every year, thankfully. Um, uh, but uh, we are seeing we are seeing trends in uh, you know Caribbean hurricanes. We're seeing more; those, those are being more frequent. They're they're more intense when they uh, when they arise. We're seeing increases in you know Cat three, four, five uh, hurricanes, and we think that that's being fueled by the warmer temperatures uh, in the uh, in the tropical Atlantic uh, and, and places. So yeah, so it's. Uh, uh, that was very that that was very sobering. Well, Chuck, did you hear? He's on a first name basis with the hurricane uh, level. Cat yes. three, cat, cat four, cat five. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm just saying. We're in I, Florida. Not, to Every, me, it's still a full in word. Florida is also. Uh... <laughs> uh, one last thing before we run over to Chuck and get some questions from our from our uh, fan base and the audience um, that have been pre collected. The the um, in in last year, uh, 2020. I heard there was like Hurricane Alpha, and I thought to myself, Alpha? Mm. Did we run out of letters of the alphabet to name these four weeks? We're starting to use the Greek alphabet. So what's up with that? I didn't know that was in, in the in the regu rules that, and regulations. That's exactly right. Yeah, so the, the National Weather Service uh, has a list of uh, pre-approved names, and they have it for, out, I think, out for another five years. Uh, it does, it's not every letter of the alphabet, but I think it's, it's 20... 
23 uh, um, names. I, that might not be quite right. But once you run out of those, then you start doing these, these Greek alphabets, uh, alpha, beta, uh, gamma, delta, uh, epsilon. I mean, uh, and so when you're seeing uh, hurricane alpha, you know it's been a bad season. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And now why only 23 uh, of the letters? I mean, uh, what names did they omit that are just so awful that we Could can't Chuck even they, put... They hate the letter <laughs> So, so there, there's, there's never been a Hurricane Xavier. Um, and, uh, so no X's. So there's, there's, no X's. Uh, yeah, so there's no, okay. there's no X's. And I, 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 you know, I should have checked on this before I came on. I, I don't know the rest of that. We can, mm. uh, okay. uh, we can, we can assign that as homework, perhaps, for the, uh, for the Climate okay. Summit. I'm looking forward to Hurricane Yvonne. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, gotta, you need to modernize the names, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Actually, oh, they, you know, so me, they, they they do modernize the names. I mean, so it used to be all very Anglo names, you know, right. Arthur and Charlie, and and they always used to be male, and then they then they started mixing it up. Now it's male and female, and right. now they're also taking names from a from a broader cultural background. So, see, uh, but is that is that uh, a good or a bad thing? In a way, it's a good thing because it means that we're recognizing that there's cultural diversity. But in a way, it's a bad thing because you're being named after a hurricane. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I don't want to, I don't, you know, in a way, it's Hurricane like, oh, it's Chuck. Just, right. It's just batters it's not, the seaboard. Hur- hurricane Rasaniqua. Like, you know. <laughs> and then what if it's like the worst hurricane ever and it's like a black name? You know what I mean? Just like, oh, of course, Hurricane LaDamian got to be the worst hurricane ever. Like... <laughs> So Chuck, let's 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 do this, Chuck. All right, let's just jump. What do you have for us? Uh, of course, all these uh, questions come from the students of uh, Broward County, and uh, I uh, I think let's start with Aiden M. And uh, let me see here, Aiden. Oh my goodness, trade. What do you have, Aiden's great grade? And what school they're at? He is in grade give five at Trade Winds Elementary. Okay. So uh, and he says this. It's a great question. Who first noticed? Global warming, which is a great question because people may think it's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, so the answer to that is actually actually goes back a, a, a long time. Uh, there was a guy called Calendar, interestingly enough, in the 1930s, uh, who was the first person to uh, put together a time series of temperatures, um, and with his knowledge of what happens in the atmosphere and the, and the important role of, of, uh, of carbon dioxide, uh, he had hypothesized that he should be able to see uh, a trend. And he was working in the, in the kind of mid-30s, uh, so kind of 1938, I think. Uh, and, and he put together this, uh, this data set, which uh, was, was pretty sparse, uh, but it was enough to see that, uh, that indeed the temperatures had changed from the, the beginning of the, of the 20th century, so about 1900 through to 1930. Uh, um, and he said, uh, yes, oh, look, it seems to be getting warmer. And this is something that we expect to happen because the physics of this had been worked out in the Victorian era, in the, in the 19th century. So, And people knew that we were burning a lot of coal, we were burning a lot of oil, and we were expecting things to happen. And happen they did. But yeah, no, it was in the, it was in the 1930, 1930s that people uh, started to notice uh, what was going on. And then we ignored it for, for another 30 there years. Uh, but and, yeah, and that's working out great, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, how's it's that like working 1930s, out for you? <laughs> we find out that we are indeed warming the planet and we go, eh, we'll get to it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to drive my car. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> Forget about the earth. I want to drive my car. But of course, if there is no earth, you can't drive your car. So people got to yes. work out the causes and effects right. of your desires there. All right. All right, Chuck, what else moving. you got for me? And um, let's go to Camila B., who is at sixth grade in Indian Ridge Middle School. Hello, Camilla. And Camilla cool. asked this. How fast are glaciers and icebergs melting? Oh, mm. I, Cam, Camilla has a sense of urgency. So, She's like, "Look, I need to know what is going down, <laughs> right?" Because <laughs> I'm here in Florida, and I need to know so, <laughs> if yeah. I should move. <laughs> 
So, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you've heard the phrase, right? Glacially slow, right? To mean something really moving so slowly that you can't even see what's going on. Well, glacially slow does not mean what it used to mean, right? So, in fact, in fact Gavin, moving- I haven't heard I haven't heard that term used in that way in at least ten years. Oh, it's, it's moving at a glacial oh, well. pace. No one says that anymore. <laughs> that's that's amazing because yeah. we know yeah. deep down. We are moving those puppies and melting them down. We okay, are. go on. I'm we sorry, are. interrupted. Uh, yes. No, no, that, that's fine. I mean, you're right. Nobody says glacially slow anymore because the glaciers are really moving quite fast. Uh, what what we do uh, at NASA is that we can keep track of how much water and ice there is on on Greenland or in Antarctica, um, and we have we have these records that they're measuring the gravity of the planet, and uh, and when the ice uh, melts, then the gravity goes down a little bit, and we can we can track that from space, which is pretty Im- impressive, quite frankly. Wait, wait, just to be um, clear, Gavin, Gavin, we know the gravity of Earth as a as a collective body. When you say NASA's measuring gravity, you mean they're measuring the difference in gravity from one part of Earth's surface to the other. Is, isn't that what you're you're talking about? Yeah. So that, and, so and that over if time more mass well. is one, in one place than another, it's going to have slightly extra gravity there rather than here. Right. That's right. So, so there's more gravity above a mountain than there is over the ocean, uh, and there's more gravity above a big ice sheet than over a little ice sheet. And so, as the ice sheets shrink, uh, then the gravity goes down a little bit, and you can calculate how much mass has disappeared from the wow. ice and has gone into the ocean. Um, and so, we we keep track of that, and uh, and we can measure, uh, for instance, the uh, the loss of mass from from Greenland. It's about 250 gigatons of water every year is is leaving Greenland. And it's about 150 gigatons of water every year that's leaving uh, uh, Antarctica, mostly from the Antarctic Peninsula and West Antarctica, which is the, the bit which is, if you go all the way down uh, through South America, to the, the bit that sticks out, that's the peninsula, and then the bit just to the side of that is uh, West Antarctica. So most so of gig- the mass in... Giga is giga, billion. Giga tons. Billion no, giga, tons. Giga is ten. Wow. Is ten to the nine. Billion ton. Two. Two. Yes. Two. So, two hundred fifty billion tons. That's right. Every, every year. Every year. Every year. Wow. That's a yeah. lot of water, and 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 that water is. So that's fresh water going into salt water. That can't be good, right? Yeah. Yeah, so so that's fresh water from the land. It's going into the ocean, and it raises sea level. It gets it does get spread okay. out mostly evenly um, around the ocean, uh, and that's adding uh, about a millimeter per year in global sea level. Um, and the uh, the total amount of sea level is is made up of that uh, plus plus changes in mountain glaciers. They're they're melting quite quickly, um, and then the warming of the ocean itself uh, is also causing the, the the sea level to rise. So the, the the sea level rise right now is about just over three millimeters a year, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's uh, it's been uh, it's been about a foot uh, around uh, around Florida in the last in the last wow. sixty to hundred okay. years, I'd say. And what I, what I try to tell people is if you fill a glass completely with water and then add three millimeters, 100% of what you add is spills. <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> yep. Just, just let's, let, let's understand that. Um, and also, uh, there's another issue here, right? Where if you're adding fresh water at large rates to salt water, that changes the sort of the circulation patterns and the sea level mix. It does. That previously okay. relied and evolved on a, was what was a stable uh, uh, salt mixture. Is that, is that correct? Right. So, uh, so the changes in freshwater, uh, so, so freshwater is lighter than salt water. So it tends to sit on the top, at least to start with, before it gets mixed down. Uh, that changes how easy it is for, for heat to get into the ocean, for carbon to get into the ocean. And so one of the things that we've seen uh, in the oceans as things have warmed up and we've got this extra fresh water is that it's becoming harder to get things down into the ocean. And that's heat and carbon. And so that's actually adding to the temperature in the atmosphere, it's adding to the carbon in the atmosphere, uh, and so it's actually uh, that that's not a good news. That's not good okay. news. Either. Sorry. Wow. All right. All right, Chuck. Keep them keep them coming, Chuck. And, and. Yeah, this is just going to get more and more depressing. I'm sorry. No. no. <laughs> you better have po- something positive uh, to say at the end of this. All right. Otherwise, oh yeah, it's the, right. last, I, I the last time we're inviting you <laughs> on something like this. Actually, I'm going to. <laughs> 
mark sean d for uh to come back to because it's a great question but it's too depressing after that answer so i <laughs> i can't i cannot ask his question later. after that answer so let's go to um uh, let's go to Maya E. And Maya E is in grade five at Trade Winds. Hi, Maya. And she says, what can we do as kids to slow down the global warming process? So here's something that's uh, a little more encouraging and, yeah, and uh, hopeful. hopeful. You got to remember that you're not just a kid, right? You are uh, a, a, a son or a daughter. You are a classmate. You are an advocate. You are uh, a consumer. Um, but you're you're all of these things. And one of the most impressive things that's happened over the last couple of years uh, related to climate is is the outpouring of. Uh, activity and concern uh, from from youth climate leaders like Greta Thunberg and and Alex Villasenor uh, in in the uh, in the US, uh, who have uh, kind of taken this and really pushed it. They pushed it to you know the the top tables, to the UN, to to government uh, decision makers, and and made it very very clear that it's not okay just to sit around and not do anything. It's, it's not okay uh, to know that this is a crisis and, and not act in a commensurate way. Um, and there's been an enormous amount of, you know, truly authentic, um, uh, you know, concerns about, about your future. I mean, speaking, speaking to the youth, I mean, not so much my future, but your future. You know, this is going to be the issue of your entire lives. It's, it's not going to go away next year. It's not going to go away in 10 years' time. Uh, it's going to be a very, very real issue for, for all of that time. And, and your role um, as, as somebody uh, who, as, as people who can, who can get uh, the grown-ups and the decision-makers to act in your interest um, is is really very important. So, so so yes, I mean you can encourage you know local recycling. You can encourage uh, renewable energy. You can encourage your school to uh, to have a you know a zero waste cafeteria. All of these things are good uh, and positive steps. What you're saying, Gavin, is that even if someone in middle school does not have power of title or power of, of, of any other sort of high-ranking official, uh, you have the power, that you have social and cultural power. Because if you're, if you're 12 years old and you write a letter to the editor of the local paper that you're concerned, I bet they're gonna publish it. And so you can have influence beyond title because, yeah. because when, if, if the 10-year-olds start worrying about how the adults are messing up the environment, that's something to take notice of. And so, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it makes and it makes the the adults feel bad. And uh, you know what, kids should make adults feel bad because they there have something go. to feel bad. About. <laughs> Start guilting your parents, kids. <laughs> Start guilting your parents. Mom, Dad, you don't love me. You don't love me. Look at what you're doing. Look at what you're doing to the planet, Mom, Dad. You don't love me. You guys suck. You suck. <laughs> Grown up suck. Grown up suck. I, yeah. that, no, that that be less productive, I think, Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, I, has, yeah, yeah. Chuck has three yeah, kids. Yeah. What are the ages of your kids, Chuck? Uh, I have a 20-year-old, and then I have a 14-year-old, and then I have a 7-year-old because I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. I have, uh, so, And I do have three children, and... Um, so you I get all three my, different perspectives there at those different age groups. It's great to yeah. see because, believe it or not, the 20-year-old is concerned about climate, but not as much as the 14-year-old. And the 7-year-old is a full-blown activist. Okay. So, <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, when I see these questions from middle schoolers, I think it's fantastic that yeah. they are already keyed in on this as a true issue of concern. So yep. it's fantastic. Welcome back to Star Talk. This episode is from a virtual live stream cosmic queries with the Broward County Youth Climate Summit. That's Broward County, Florida. And we've been talking about the science of climate change. I've got my co-host Chuck Nice and our special guest, climatologist Gavin Schmidt. And we've been answering questions from the students themselves. 
about the future of the climate crisis. So let's get back to it. All right, Chuck, keep it coming. All right, let's keep going now. Um, if you've right. just joined us, probably you should have been there from the beginning, but if you just joined us, we are at the Broward County Youth Climate Summit, third annual, and we're talking to Floridians about climate. And we've got with me Gavin Schmidt, senior advisor to NASA on climate and director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. I didn't say it at the beginning, but Goddard, it's abbreviated GIS, and GIS specializes in, in, in many things, but especially climate on planets. What, is, what the atmosphere is doing, what the environment around, what, you know, solar heating, cooling within the atmospheres, turbulence, all of this. So Earth as just another planet can give you a cosmic perspective on the things yep. that can go wrong on a, in a planetary atmosphere. Right? right. And so, so, Gavin, tell me two planets where stuff really went wrong in the past. <laughs> so that was that was that's an easy one. Uh, so you've got Venus and you've got Mars. Uh, so uh, Venus. What, one is to uh, our left actually, and the other is to our right. They're right. They're, yeah, they're adjacent yeah. to us. OK. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, Venus uh, may well have been the first habitable planet in the solar system. Uh, and for a long time, for about a billion years, uh, may have been uh, able to maintain water at the surface. Uh, but as the sun got brighter over time, it, you know, it, it, and it's still getting a little bit brighter, uh, the uh, the oceans uh, evaporated, the hydrogen was lost, and uh, and it's turned into a, a hellhole where uh, lead will melt on the surface. So, um, but you, yeah, can, so that, I, I that, did the that, calculation, that well. Gavin. I did the calculation. Yes, it can melt lead. Fine, but you could cook a 16-inch pepperoni pizza on your windowsill in three seconds. So that's, that's, the, that, well, that's an advantage. You see, there's a, there's a silver lining to this high-temperature yeah, planet. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Except then, that you, you, yeah, your charred remains will have a delicious <laughs> meal. <laughs> okay. uh, you be vaporized too, but and ignoring that complication, yes. it would be an awesome pizza oven. That's all yes. I'm saying. But but like I said, it, it, it might have been the first habitable place in the uh, in the solar system for about uh, for about a billion years. Um, so so and then something, you've something got bad Mars. happened on Venus. Ba something bad something happened on bad. Venus. Yeah. All right, now how about Mars? Now Mars. Uh, now we, we you know we see evidence for water on Mars, and uh, and so we think that uh, at some point Mars, uh, a little bit more recently than than Venus, was uh, was habitable. There was there was sufficient water on the surface to, uh, to to have running water, and so we're trying to work out uh, what combination of of atmospheric uh, composition could have could have led to that. Um, but uh, that 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 is that is long in the past, and. Uh, uh, you know, and now obviously uh, Mars is extremely dry. Uh, it's lost whatever. I mean, it still has some uh, atmosphere, but it's it, it lost uh, a lot of its atmosphere. It lost a lot of its water, um, and now is uh, is is does not have very much of a greenhouse effect, um, and uh, and is very cold and uh, uh, has pretty sunsets. Um, and you would be <laughs> hard pressed to cook a pepperoni pizza at any time uh, 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 right now on Mars. Okay, so Mars doesn't have any running water anymore, but it once did, but it has pretty sunsets. So Chuck, there's a, so those are the two reasons, one to go to Venus and one to go to Mars. Get a pretty there you sunset. go. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so that's right. I, you know, no air, but God, the views. <laughs> the views are beautiful. Okay. The views are gorgeous. <laughs> can't so can't Chuck, breathe, can, but <laughs> enjoy those views. All right. Okay, here we go. Keep them coming. I love this question from Sierra E. And Sierra E is in the ninth grade at Coral Springs High School. And Sierra is not playing around. She wants to know this. What kind of jobs are there for people interested in climate and climate studies? Sierra, I don't... Let me just say, Sierra, I'm already proud of you, okay? You're not only looking to solve the existential crisis that faces all of mankind, but you're like, how do I make some money off of this? <laughs> I love you, Sierra. That's the way to think. 
<laughs> so there, there's some there's some great uh, there's some great opportunities. Um, so the the kinds of tech jobs uh, that are going to be important are things like smart grid technology, storage technology, uh, renewables, uh, all of those things that are going to be growing uh, enormously. Uh, energy in, storage in the next few decades. When you say e- storage, energy storage. Energy yes. storage. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, the adaptation part of it. You know, how do you uh, help cities and agriculture uh, plan for the changes to come? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, social science uh, issues there. There's a lot of politi- politics uh, involved there. Um, but without those people, like all the technology in the world doesn't help us, right? Things need to be deployed. Uh, things need to be used. Th- you know, what, what is it? How is that change going to happen? Uh, and uh, the people that are making that change or helping enable that change, uh, they're going to be the most important people uh, around. And uh, and so th- those aren't necessarily STEM jobs. That you know, they could be public service. They could be um, uh, urban planning. Uh, they could. Could be uh, you know people who are interested in in sewage and septic tanks and like dealing with um, the legacy of what we've built now and the infrastructure that's in uh, uh, that's that's in peril right now and how to make it resilient and and how to deal with the problems that are going to come. Yeah, Gavin, so that's it, a brilliant brilliant answer there. And I had not fully grokked how interdisciplinary climate science in our society would be because right you said you got you need the scientist you're among them you need the policy people you're among them but but it, a cool invention that pulls us off of fossil fuels into other forms of energy that would be industry but then you still have to deploy it so you get the politics i love it uh, everybody can get a piece of that pie it's it, it's a problem that affects every single area of our lives which means that if you think of it in terms of systems change then whatever you do in life, if you relate it to climate, there is an application. There you go. So, And by there the way, is. I have not fully grokked the word grokked. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> it's a geek word, and I, I, I forgot what its origin is, but if you look it Robert up- Robert Heinlein. It, yeah, Robert Heinlein, thank you. Uh, okay. It comes from science fiction, and it's spelled G-R-O-K. G-R-O-K. It has to do with- Wrapping your head around an issue or a problem and coming to terms with it within yourself, possibly yeah. then being able to do something about it. Did, did, am see, I good there? Did I get that right, Gavin? I think so. I'm trying to remember the book in which it first appeared. Um, mm-hmm. It might have been The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, but uh, but I, I, okay. I forget the details. Mm-hmm. But it was well, it was very big in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. So Well, there you, know, you go, kids. For the, for, this for the is... youth among us, that's, that's where it comes from. <laughs> This is when you know that you're in the secret astrophysics club when you can actually use the word grok and then know its freaking origins. <laughs> this is you're seeing the secret geek speak that these scientists have with one another. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm so, someone, someone look that up. Where, where, which book did it come from? Live long uh, and prosper. Yes. Live, okay. Good. Yeah, right. Thank you for bringing it back down to my level. Thank you. <laughs> Live, uh, all right. Let's move on back. Let's not move on. Let's go back to Sean D, who has a, a very sobering question. He's at grade six at um, Margate Middle School. Uh, And Sean D. wants to know this. What do you fear will happen in the future if we take no action? All right. So there goes, Gavin. Give us the apocalyptic (laughs) scenarios. Um, Wait, wait, let me, I'll start off. I'll start off. I'll start off and I'll hand off to you. The Broward County Youth Climate Summit in 20 years will be held underwater (laughs) Yeah, it's not, that's not funny. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm what sorry. was funny was you say, hey, hey, that's not funny. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> okay, go um, on. I mean, no, so, I mean, like, if, 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 we, if we don't rise to this moment, then the sea will rise to this moment. Oh, wow. You know, if 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 there's a bumper sticker for you, get I'm telling you right now, us. that's a t-shirt. That's a t-shirt. That's a, that's a t-shirt, a bumper sticker, a meme. Yeah. Okay. All right. Wait, wait. Say that again, so we can get 
we can get a meme shot of you <laughs> yeah. like right there. I'm going to get a yeah, screenshot. Exactly. Okay, go. <gasps> Say it again. Uh, if we don't rise to this moment, the seas will rise to this moment. Wow. Boom. Boom. Okay, now, That's beautiful. Mic drop. Um, it, we're boom. done here. We're done. <laughs> No, but I mean, but you know, this this is a, this is a serious question. I mean, like the 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 worst case scenarios that that we've plotted out. You know, if we go, if we don't do anything, we just like we just we just burn all of the fossil fuels that we can. We burn all of the coal, all of the oil, the methane hydrates, the uh, the tar sands, the oil shales, all of the rest of it. Uh, we we could have an impact on this planet that has not been seen in in tens of millions of years. Maybe maybe even maybe even longer. Uh, the, the Anthropocene, the, the period that we're now creating, uh, would be so far out of like the normal bounds of, of, of climate variability that, quite frankly, we don't even know what kind of a planet that would be. Right, we're talking about, you know, if you, uh, something more recent, like the, the the last ice age, right, which was only twenty thousand years ago, and and that was caused by, you know, uh, wobbles in the Earth's orbit. Uh, that was about yeah eight to nine degrees Fahrenheit cooler than today, right? The worst case scenarios, if we just don't do anything and and burn everything that we can find, uh, that's about eight to nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than where we are now. Right. And the last ice age, think about that, you know, uh, massive ice sheets across the whole of North America, mammoths and uh, a very, very different planet. And, and then kind of like flip that and say, well, well, what kind of planet would it be if it was that much warmer? And we, we don't know. We don't know what kind of planet that would be. Uh, it would be one that uh, that we and our current society would be would be in trouble. Like we have so much stuff next to the coast. We have so many expectations. You know, our agriculture, you know, where we grow things, how we grow things depends on the climate where we are. If things shift to such a degree, then all of those anticipations, all of those expectations are, are worthless. Wait, 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 Gavin, you uh, said so, we have so much stuff near the coast. You're talking about yeah, cities. Like New York. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Cities yeah. Are I mean, New York and harbors and, you know, how, you know, our world is a connected world, you know, Miami. We move things around. Mm -hmm. Miami, like, but Shanghai and Calcutta and Bombay, Mumbai, uh, you know, Shenzhen, London, Paris, uh, all of these places are actually very close to the coasts. And, uh, you know, and if you think that, uh, you know, our heritage uh, such as it is, should be worth preserving, then, you know, not doing anything about climate change is not the way to maintain that. Mm. So now, um, as we talk about the loss of these coastal cities, <clears throat> is, is there a way to target climate change so that we could just take out a few places that perhaps that we don't want around anymore? <laughs> I'm joking, Gavin. That's a joke. <laughs> Did you see his face, Neil? Man, if it he had like... a sign that says joke on it, then I would know. Welcome back to Star Talk. This episode is from a virtual live stream Cosmic Queries with the Broward County Youth Climate Summit in Florida. And we've been talking about the science of climate change with my co-host Chuck Nice and our special guest climatologist Gavin Schmidt. And we've been answering questions from the students themselves about the future of this climate crisis in which we find ourselves. So let's get right back to it. All right, so let's, um, let's go to Natalia P. She's in 11th grade over at West Broward High School. And um, she's looking at this from a policy standpoint. What are some laws? that could be enacted in order to slow down climate change. So is there anything that we can do that we should ask our governments to do to take right. us so, out of this? 
Yeah, so I'm I'm part of the government, so I have to be a little bit careful here. Uh, so you know, I can give my my personal opinion. Obviously, you know, NASA doesn't really have much of an impact on uh, uh, on on laws and policy directly. But you know, but my personal uh, view is that you know we, there are laws that that exist that that are pushing us in the right direction. Uh, things like renewable standards uh, for uh, for electricity. Uh, things like um, uh, you know encouraging uh, electric vehicles. Uh, over uh, internal combustion vehicles. Um, a price on carbon uh, is something that nudges everything in, in the right direction. So these things are, are difficult to enact. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there's a lot of politics uh, behind what actually does get enacted. Um, but but even, like, even things that you think might be trivial, like building codes, you know, you, you can do a lot with uh, improving building codes so that they take account of not just the climate changes that you've had, but the climate changes that we're going to have. Uh, we can we can make um, uh, rules that make buildings uh, use less energy and are made with more uh, resilient uh, structures. I mean, so so we we can both um, legislate to improve resilience um, and to reduce. Uh, um, energy wastage. Uh, so you know, laws on uh, if uh, standards for refrigerators. You know, I mean, the fact that we've had uh, if more efficient refrigerators for for the last uh, fifty years um, has saved an enormous number of uh, power stations from ever being built. Right, so uh, so efficiency gains can be helped, like the cafe standards, uh, where they're looking at the at the miles per gallon of the of the vehicle fleet. Uh, all of those things are, are pushing us in the right direction. Mm. Okay. All right, well, that's right. hopeful. That is very hopeful. nice. Good mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. We like that. Uh -huh. All right, let's. Um, <clears throat> Alessandro. Oh, by the way, so so go West ahead. Broward High School. So go yeah. Bobcats. Oh, right, right okay. on. <laughs> Why I know okay. that? I don't know, but go Bobcat. All right, go ahead. Alessandra M. Uh, is a fifth grader at Trade Winds Elementary School. And she's got a good question about what, what does global warming have to do with severe weather events like storms mm -hmm. and heat waves, droughts, and hurricanes? So that, that I, I love that because because Gavin, I mean, think about it. If you just if you're just thinking, all right, it's one degree warmer in the world. Yeah, the, fl the temperature fluctuates so much more than that from between day and night. Why? How mm -hmm. could one degree matter to anything else that's going on on this planet? So, uh, so really, that's a, that's a question of, of of how things change on average, and how that gets translated into things that we think of more as weather. Um, and that's a that's a great question uh, because well, first, tell us the says, difference it's between not, it's not weather obvious. and climate. Just just spend a minute. Right. The difference between those. So two. so yeah. So so weather. I mean, you know, it's it's what's happening today. It's my, what, what's happening next week. It's changeable. It's kind of chaotic. Um, and and climate is really the average of of all of that. Over you know, averaged over many years and looking at the statistics over many years, um, and. Uh, there, there isn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's not. It's not totally obvious how these things um, uh, connect. Uh, but we now have a large enough climate change signal that we're starting to see how those things connect. So, so let me give you some some of the pathways by which the, these connections happen. Right. So as the planet gets warmer, right, it's warmed more than a degree Celsius. So it's almost two degrees Fahrenheit uh, at this point in the last hundred years or so. Uh, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increases, right? So, so it turns out that uh, uh, you increase the uh, the water vapor by about ten percent with that amount of temperature change, right? So, so there's now ten percent more water in the air than there used to be, and if you think about uh, storms and if you think about uh, rain systems, uh, what you're doing there is you're gathering up a lot of quite moist air, you're pushing it up, and then it all rains out. And if there's more water in the air, more water vapor in the air, when you squeeze it all together and you push it up, it comes out and it comes out more and stronger. And so what we've seen- uh, By the way, over, that's just what Floridians want. They want more humid air. <laughs> that's what they want. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, so it is getting more humid. I mean, you can you can track that in the in the weather yeah. statistics in mm-hmm. Miami uh, as well. Um, but yeah, so so you have more humid air and you have more intense rainfall, and you can see that uh, happening uh, not just uh, associated with big storm events like like hurricanes, uh, but you can see it more generally uh, when you have a front coming through, uh, you know, kind of from the Pacific side to, to the Atlantic side. Uh, you can see that the that the statistics of rain are pushing us towards more intense rainfall. Um, and we discussed it earlier, you know, the, the temperatures themselves uh, in the ocean are leading to uh, more intense uh, storms in the uh, in the Atlantic because the heat uh, of the water is is really the the fuel that drives uh, the hurricanes and so we're seeing more intense uh, hurricanes uh, happening because of those temperatures as well and obviously and, 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 as things get wait Gavin sorry. if it's if it's one degree on average that means in some places it'll be much more than that. Correct. Right. So, uh, so the places that are warming the most actually are, are in the high latitudes. In in the um, uh, in the Arctic, it's warmed. You know, three, four, some places five degrees uh, uh, Celsius. Just, just in, where we need last. it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, not really. No. <laughs> uh, but we're seeing, but we're seeing quite clear warming in the uh, in the tropical uh, tropical Atlantic. Uh, that's one of the places where most of the hurricanes start off, and so so that's kind of juicing them up um uh a little bit um and obviously you know if the temperatures are warming and you know and weather is that kind of noise on top of that you're going to see more heat waves you know more days over 90 degrees more days over 100 degrees um and uh, and you can see that happening uh it, you know all around uh, all around the world you know from australia through to uh, uh to the us to europe to japan to asia uh you know we had um you know massive heat waves in in uh, in siberia last summer uh, you know siberia yeah. not a warm place but they had like 100 degrees above the arctic circle uh that's not usual right um in fact it may even be unique uh, and so you're a new, new vacation at, spot, a new vacation spot, Siberia, right? uh, <laughs> sunny lots Siberia, of, uh, right, right, lots of beachfront property there. Yes. <laughs> um, well, we only have a few minutes left. Let's see if we can get a few uh, squeezed in there. And Gavin, this is going to be a lightning round. So real quick, give me Got sound, it. your best soundbite answer. Go, Chuck. Uh, this is for, uh, well, we're going to switch gears here because um, this is from Carlos B and Tyler B. I don't know if they're related. Uh, Pines Middle School and Pioneer Middle School, respectively, grades right. seven and six. Um, what got you interested in being an astrophysicist, planetary scientist, author, and science communicator? That's for both of you. Uh, thanks for asking about being a comedian there, Tyler. I mean, uh, Carlos. <laughs> Pre- appreciate that, Carlos. Um, and then Tyler B. says... What inspired you to do what you do? So what got you interested in the specific work that you do? And what made you go to science in the first place? I, I don't know how sound biteable this is. So we're probably gonna have to end on these questions. So Gavin, why don't you go? Um, for me, I, I, I started with mathematics and, uh, and it was the joy of just like kind of solving things and, uh, and solving puzzles. And then, uh, and then I got into things that actually meant things to people. And I realized that you could solve problems that people would appreciate and that they would care about. And the more that I've done and the more that people care and the more I'm able to talk to people, uh, about these things, uh, the more excited and the more interested I got in the science that I was doing. So you got good feedback on your ambitions. I did. Yeah, that's very important there. Because <laughs> not, not everyone, if you, if you like math and then you, you have a peer group that says, you like math? Ew. What do you, you know, I, that could turn a lot of people off if they still right. want to sort of hang out with the cool kids. And by the way, if that happens to you, anyone listening, uh, they're just jealous. <laughs> That you're good at math. <laughs> don't don't fall for it. <laughs> now, and, and Chuck, is it true that when when you were a kid, if you're if you're cracking up in class, the teacher says, "You if you keep this up, you'll only amount to be a being a comedian or something." Absolutely, yeah. I'm, uh, I've had that said to me. Like, what do you think you are a comedian? I'm like. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for me, I, my, my, my profile is, is, is well known, I think, because written, I've written about it and spoken about it. I was nine years old and a first trip to my local planetarium. 
the Hayden Planetarium. And in fact, when I sign off this show, uh, my tagline is, keep looking up. That was a famous tagline uh, who was called the Star Hustler from the Miami Planetarium for many, many years. Um, and he, he was the head of the planetarium, and he had a, a show, on a, a short bit on PBS, giving sort of that week's night sky. And um, what was his name? Jack, uh, I remembered in a minute. And so he signed off, uh, but th he died several years back, and I say, somebody's got to carry that forward. So I, I, I carry his legacy. Whenever I sign off, I say, keep looking up. So planetariums were, uh, can be a tremendous force of influence on people's uh, ability, uh, interest in looking up, but also uh, astrophysics, just the universe in general, is a gateway science. It's a gateway science because if you're interested in that, then you find out, oh my gosh, I need to, there's biology there. There's engineering that make the, the satellites. There's, there's, uh, there's physics, there's chemistry. And so uh, you, you come for the universe and you stay for the whole rest of that smorgasbord of science. And I looked up at the night sky in the planetarium and I said, oh my gosh, the, the, the limitless discovery that awaits us is what attracted me. And to communicate science, I agree with Gavin here. If you tell somebody something and they like it and they want more, that's kind of, that's reinforcing. And then you find something else to tell them that's really cool and interesting about your field. And as Carl Sagan once said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So... I think we got to call it quits there. Oh my gosh, this was wow. fun. And this is, this is our Cosmic Queries format. And I'm delighted that we got asked by the Broward County School System to bring our Cosmic Queries format into your universe. And because that's what we do and it's what we love to do. And, and Gavin, always great to have you on Star Talk. Uh, always a pleasure. And we got to make sure that uh, that the president of the United States will have your ear along with the head of NASA. And so if stuff doesn't go right, we'll blame you. OK, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's, that's fair. fair. That, that's totally fair. And, and, <laughs> and, and Chuck, it's always good to have you. Thanks for uh, bringing us a force of levity into this world, because sometimes we need it. Otherwise, we'll just cry. <laughs> it's, just, it's always just, a pleasure. I'm just saying. And let me end by by declaring that I don't know in the history of the world if there's ever been a community of adults who, upon looking at the next generation, said, I can't wait till you all take over to fix this stuff. <laughs> take a look at what adults have said about the next generation for the past 4,000 years. And we've always worried about what the next generation would be and do. But maybe for the first time, the opposite is the case. So you all hurry up, get older, and gain the power we need to fix this world. Save us, children! <laughs> I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, as always, bidding you to keep looking up. <laughs>